So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ben, and that was Adrian. He'll be up, back up later. He's going to do some live coding uh, exercises, so you can see how physics actually works. But before we do that, I'm going to give us some background, how we actually build this up, um, and what kind of the point of this is, right? Because when we say a vision for verifying the ZX calculus, that immediately asks the question: Why do we need to verify it? What What's the purpose of that? Um, obviously, we're not going back to check the mathematics. What we're really doing is we're creating a library that can be used by other uh, software engineers to then build operations on ZX diagrams that are, are that have the ability to prove facts about them, like an optimization, right? Uh, we might want to guarantee that our optimization patches preserve semantics. There's a lot of different ways that uh, different optimi optimizers handle this. Um, unit testing, SMT-based verification, translation validation, um, like is handled in physics. And they can't verify every optimization is completely correct. There still could be bugs in the actual verification itself. And, um, you know, even if they show that, yeah, oh, there's a bug here, and then you fix the bug, it doesn't guarantee the absence of bugs. It just allows you to refine your program and make it better. But verification actually can give us these guarantees. Um, Vox is a quantum program circuit optimizer uh, that actually uses the same methods to verify the optimizations are completely correct. And this, this gives us some peace of mind, right? If we're writing a quantum program, we don't want to have to worry about bugs in the compiling optimizer, in the actual code we're writing, and in the just noisy nature of these, these quantum computers. If we can eliminate from the at least optimizing compiler, it gives us some peace of mind to go back and look at our code, see maybe something there went wrong. So uh, if maybe you believe now that, OK, there's a point to verifying this, you have to look at, well, how can you actually do this verification? Uh, we use a proof assistant called Coq, and in Coq, uh, verification works very well with things like inductive data structures, but very poorly with things like dictionaries and maps, where the underlying implementation might be obfuscated by some interface. Uh, so we wanted to find some sort of inductive way to talk about ZX diagrams, and so we, we think back to, to just base string diagrams, not worrying about spiders yet, and just say, okay, well, how can we put these things together, take them apart? Um, there's, we're working with symmetric ones, so we have this symmetric swap. We have composition, where we want to guarantee that the uh, outputs of the first one and the inputs of the second one line up perfectly. And then the ability to parallelize things, and then uh, throw in caps and cups to turn yourself around. And you have a language to build string diagrams inductively. It might not be you know, the cleanest definitions in the world, but it comes down to about six things in total once you throw in the wire, so it is very dense. Uh, if instead of just throwing in the wire, though, we add Z, Z and X spiders, then what we get is this very simple kind of way to say, okay, well, specify to me the inputs and outputs and rotations, and sure, you have a Z spider or an X spider, and we have a dependent type happening here, um, which is going to be essential. Cock is uh, built off of dependent types. It's what we're going to be using for all our proofs. And so we're saying that these are ZX diagrams with specific numbers of inputs and specific numbers of outputs. Um, and then we can throw in all the observations we make about the string diagram, include the caps, cups, swaps, and an empty diagram, which is useful sometimes. And then at our compose and our sec, and with just these things, we have a very dense inductive definition for uh, ZX diagrams. And you can represent any diagram in this way. So now that we have the structure, we need to give it some meaning. So we apply a semantics. For our semantics, we go back to something called quantum lib, which is a part of this inquire verified quantum software stack, which also includes Vox, which I mentioned earlier. And physics is also a part of inquire. Our goal is to kind of have these things work somewhat well together and maybe use physics to build some ZX optimization passes into Vox or a separate optimizer based on the ZX calculus there. Um, but so we, we go into this, this matrix definition, which is the standard matrix definition. We also have a brockhead notation, which can be used and translated between. Um, the X spider is a bit different, right? We have Hadamards on both sides instead of actually taking it to the semantics. This is, it's equivalent, but this simplifies proof a lot for us. Um, and then we'll add in cap, cup, swap, empty semantics, and compose goes to multiplication, stack goes to chronicler. It's all fairly standard things that you might be have picked up in the other ZX talks. Um, so once we have structure and we have meaning, we need to have some way to talk about equivalence of diagrams. And so we do that in Cog by defining a relation. Our relation is just, oh, well, is there a constant multiplier difference between the two semantics of these diagrams? If that is, we'll call them proportional, and we have this nice symbol we can use. 
um, we then have to tell Koch, and we have to prove to it that this is actually an equivalence relation. Um, once we do that, we get access to all these nice rewriting capabilities. Rewriting in Koch will allow us to say, we have a diagram in our proof environment. And let's say we want to change some nested part within that. We can use a Koch tactic called rewrite to actually perform this rewrite within the diagram, update the proof goal context, and complete the proof. So because our definition is weird, we end up having to change a bit of the rules and a bit of the structure. Our spider fusion isn't uh, fully complete. We're working on making a more general one. But for right now, we have fusion when there's just a single uh, connection between them. Things like the hop rule don't really have to change too much because it is just relying on this single composition. So it has a natural interpretation in the inductive thing. Uh, the by pi rule is a modification of the pi copy rule. Because this by pi rule is more regular, for our inductive definitions, it makes a lot more sense to look at it like this. But it is equivalent to the pi copy rule. If you take that top left green spider, copy it through, you'll have two pi greens all around, which is just the identity. So, And you can prove the other one. Uh, the other direction as well. So, and then we have a sort of one nice natural idea that we get from the ZX calculus is, well, if you have a proportionality of two diagrams, you get a proportionality for the dual, the color swapped version. And we actually managed to automate that within physics. So if you have a theorem which says one diagram is equivalent to another diagram, you immediately get a theorem about the color swapped, the duals. And we use that by just saying, oh, well, it's just the same as if you put Hadamards around it and then actually swap the colors, and then you do the rewrite within there, and then the Hadamards go away, and it swaps colors again. So there are certain limitations to this inductive definition. Um, we kind of buried the idea of adjacency, right? The standard uh, way you would want to talk about a ZX diagram is with a graph. Adjacency is immediately obvious there. You can use a dictionary map, whatever your actual implementation is, the adjacency is readily available. And it's not quite as clear that it's readily available in this. Um, and we also get more structural properties from these inductive uh, constructors. right? So we have to figure out how does associativity work? How uh, does distributivity work? And actually, Adrian's going to come up and talk about that for you guys now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So now we're going to go into the live coding part of this talk. And for this, we're going to look at one of the rules that Ben just mentioned. So if we have distributivity between our composes and stacks. While this is fairly obvious to us humans, we need to prove this for cock. So let's consider the case we have here. We have four different ZX diagrams with dimensions that are correctly lined up. And we can say that the composition of the stacks is the same as the stack of the compositions. And if we jump over into cock, we've now got our proof assistant loaded. Can the back row tell me if this is large enough? OK, great. Um, so first, we'll define our ZX diagrams, make sure all the dimensions line up in our uh, proof statement. And then we'll define our actual proof term. And as you can see, this is fairly natural. We've got a lot of notation here to simplify readability of our statements. And with that, we can jump into the proof. Oh. So first of all, we'll introduce our variables as it is standard in proof assistance. And since we're going to prove this through the actual matrix equality and not use the ZX rewrite capabilities Ben talked about, we need to unfold our proportionality. And so now we see exactly what Ben told us. Proportionality is just having a constant that is not 0, such that the diagrams are equal up to that constant. So in our case, we know the constant is going to be 1, so we can immediately introduce that. If you wouldn't know your constant's value, that wouldn't be an issue. Cock has ways to deal with that. So let us now work on proving the semantics equivalent. First of all, we'll simplify a bit to get down to, uh, to get the semantics of compose and stack unraveled. Uh, we will get rid of this constant C1 here uh, using a bit of automation. And now we're in a form where we can use quantum libs underlying rewrite rules to solve this proof. So we just have a rule that exactly corresponds to what we need. And now we have an equivalent statement, and we can complete the proof except that there's one less thing to do. We need to prove that one's not equal to zero, but we have automation for proving non-zero proofs. So this proof was a little verbose, mainly to show the demo of how you would go about proving, a thing, proving something at a fairly low level. But in practice, we'd probably use something that's a little shorter using a lot of proof automation we've built into physics and into quantum lib, and we can solve this proof very quickly. 
So next up, uh, I want to show how we can build things on top of physics. And for that, we'll build something that's some fairly common in actual work with physics. That is an end stack. End stack is basically the idea of taking a ZX diagram and stacking, stacking it n times on top of itself. So for the base case, we'll have an empty diagram. And for an inductive case, we'll have a diagram stacked on top of the end stack of the previous end stack. And now we want to show distributivity across that end stack. And this proof is going to be a little different than the previous one in that we're not actually going to go down to matrix semantics, but we're purely going to talk about ZX diagrams. And that is sort of our goal for physics in general. We do not want to have to talk about matrix semantics, but rather just about ZX diagrams. All right, so let's start off this proof. Uh, we're going to proceed inductively, and we're first going to deal with the base case, and we're going to simplify that a little bit and we immediately see we just have empty diagrams everywhere. So in general, uh, there are often cases where you simplify your statements and you have empty diagrams floating around, but we have automation to get rid of any superfluous empty diagram. And with that automation, we're already done with the, in, uh, the inductive base case. And now we move on to our inductive step. And first of all, we're gonna simplify this a little bit and unfold the inductiveness of it. And now we can kind of see that this aligns very closely with what we just did, our compose and stack distributivity. And so we can use our previous lemma that we had just defined to simplify this goal. And now we can see it's pretty much the same module of the inductive hypothesis. So we apply the inductive hypothesis and we get the same diagram. And that's it, we're complete. And with that, we're gonna hop over to the presentation and quickly summarize. So we talked a little bit about why we want to verify uh, the ZX calculus, why it's important, especially in the quantum world, to have guarantees for correctness, especially in optimizers. We looked at our inductive structuring of our ZX diagrams, how they relate to string diagrams and how they're different. We looked at how we encoded semantics and equivalence for inductive diagrams, the rules we built out of that. And we looked at a small example of how physics can be used for diachromatic rewriting. On the side, you'll also find our GitHub and our archive links. So if you're interested in checking out more on the project, please use those links. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for the talk. So you, uh, I'll do it to it already that you have, can have this sort of uh, exchange law for monoidal categories that you've proven this for the next diagrams. Can you prove sort of the, in, the entire meta rule of only connectivity matters so that you, you can treat the next diagrams as a simple graph where the connectivity, it doesn't matter in which direction it flows and the cups and caps can sort of be yanked into a straight line. Is all of this already provable or is this sort of more of a goal you're striving towards? So that is not yet, um proven in the system we have, but yes, that is one of the things that we are planning on working on very soon. We've actually been talking about that sort of this week is, you know, so showing only connectivity matters, getting rid of these caps and cups and just moving things over. Um, the density of this representation that we have makes that a little bit difficult, but um, you can imagine there's like a normal form where you have compositions only at the top and stacks only below that. And then it's easy to talk about, well, okay, so it's only compositions at the top, then we can treat these whole stacks as large objects and move them around each other, um, which is one way that we're working on approaching that exact problem. Uh, just as a, a follow-up, um, so there is uh, the original, I think, Ross and Street paper on monoidal categories and string diagrams can represent these sort of formally. Uh, would this be, like, if you succeed this, would this also be sort of like a, a formal proof of that result from that paper? Uh, I'm not familiar with that result. I, I don't know if... Uh, I'm not familiar enough with to the results you're proof. referring to, but um, uh, I think it's, um, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on like that specific thing, but I think it's like the original paper that sort of, that sort of showed you should use string diagrams to t reason about strict monodal categories. Um, yeah, like, I've, I've only seen later because, research on that. Because like the first reaction, a lot of people have to seeing string diagrams is, oh, surely this can't be rigorous. And if you have like a formal proof that yes, it is rigorous, it would be nice. I mean, <laughs> this, I guess in a way you could see this as a, a formal rigorous proof because we take it down to these matrices and work directly with these semantics. And, and it's, so it's, it's almost like an embedding of these diagrams into the matrices. And then you can just work in the diagrams world and not have to think about the matrices. But in the background, it's, it's handling all that for you. Yeah, these people who say that they're starting to die out, so you shouldn't worry too much. <laughs> so you're working on uh, proving equivalence up to proportional, up to proportionality, which is a pretty common way to use the ZX calculus. Uh, if you wanted to make uh, it reason exactly up to, you know, basically up 
uh, to precise scalars, then of course you can always include scalar gadgets in your rewrites. But uh, if you wanted to represent the scalars more directly, what obstacles would you see or do you think that that would be straightforward to do? This is you because you've done Yeah, it. so this is actually fairly possible in Coq because Coq is, very, is constructive in its nature. So any existence is explicit and we can just recreate the scalars and I think uh, John van der Vettering has a proof on how to exactly construct these scalars and we'd be able to do that in, in our library and we've done that for a certain subclass of scalars. I don't re exactly recall what the limitation on that is right now, but... We've done like uh, root two and one plus something. And yeah. We, we, so. <laughs> and anything that you can multiply for those together. But um, we ended up dropping that because this notion allows us to work a bit quicker. And then later on, you could easily come in and, and add in the actual construction of the scalars as these gadgets. Thank you. Uh, keep, it, keep it short. Uh, have you tried to uh, verify some concrete uh, optimizations of diagrams, for example? So let's say you take some like, big, big diagram which has been optimized by an external tool and then you can use your tool to confirm that they're indeed uh, the same? Uh, we have not done that. However, we have done certain work towards getting the framework of optimization ready. For example, the color swapping rule that we showed earlier is a very straightforward optimization of taking out two Hadamards in the sides and swapping colors. So we sort of built the infrastructure around it, but we're right now still working on getting that pattern matching working through those normal forms that Ben mentioned in an earlier question. Very cool stuff, guys. Um, two quick questions related. Whoa. First of all, how, how much proof search is already automated in this and can it do a lot on its own or do you have to drive it? Uh, so when we go down to the matrix libraries, uh, Quantum Lib has a lot of automatic proof search. For example, for a lot of matrix constructions, you can even completely crunch the matrices automatically if you as a human see they're equal. Uh, there is a lot of simplification that is there. For ZX diagrams, I guess it's sort of hard to answer the question because we we're still at an early stage where we believe that we have a lot of automation covered, but it would need a bit more real world use to actually evaluate that statement properly. But we're certainly working towards the goal of having a lot of proof automation and a lot of infrastructure to get rid of uh, common tasks. I would say the biggest piece of automation we have is the, um, the color swapped dual. If you have a proof already made, you can call a tactic and hand it that theorem and it'll just prove the dual for you. Um, but yeah, in general, we don't have too much automation quite yet because we're still dealing with these matrix level um, computations. So we thank you again.